Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to the first in our Urban Water Series. My name is Albert Rezga. I'm president and CEO of the Greater New Orleans Foundation. And uh, as befits an event like this, if you feel the need to get up and hydrate, please do so. There's water uh, just outside the door. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, director of regional initiatives at the Greater New Orleans Foundation, uh, Dr. Marco Cachito Manak, who will introduce uh, this, this program and our speakers. Thank you very much. Mark. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, Albert. So it, first of all, a big thanks to all of you, first of all, for responding so enthusiastically to this series. We really appreciate it. To the Urban Institute and specifically to Dr. Sandy Rosenblum, who helped us to coordinate this series. Um, Martha Landrum and Julia McMullen in the Greater New Orleans Foundation helped to put this together and to make this a very real thing, so thank you so much. Betsy Gamble and Gretchen Hurt played their enormous part in this as well. As did our advisory committee, composed of Dana Brown, the, uh, the omnipresent Grasshopper Mendoza and Steve Piku with our Water Challenge every year, which is our annual partnership with the Idea Village, so thank you so much. Um, David Wagner and Jeff Thomas, one of our speakers. Um, our regional partners are our are, are number in the, in the I, w I wanted to say the thousands, but not quite. We have 32 of them, and we, they represent the diversity of organizations in this region, from business to nonprofit groups to neighborhood groups to uh, NGOs and the city and the Sewerage and Water Board, and we're extremely grateful for, for their partnership. And so um, we wanted to thank them publicly. We have, instead of boring you with a, with a recitation of that rather lengthy list, we actually have them listed um, in strategic portions of this very building. So um, all five of these workshops are being videotaped. I should mention that. This is sort of a technical advisory slash warning and will be available for viewing in their entirety on Ganoff's dazzlingly new and upgraded website for the day, for the each day after each session. So within a 24-hour period, those of you who have become so captivated by the topics in this series that you want to relive them, by all means, click on our website www.gnof.org, and you'll be able to see them in their unedited entirety. And so, so that we don't uh, miss a single word that's said, we would encourage you, at the conclusion of our speakers um, giving their presentations, um, if you ask questions, please speak into a microphone so that we can pick up every word that you say. That would be greatly appreciated. All right. So, also the Urban Water Series as you might have gathered by now, is just that, a series. Uh, and we invite you to join us for all five workshops. We have a handy, rather attractive pamphlet that Julie and Martha put together. Looks a little bit like this. If you haven't picked up a copy in, the, in your way in, you can certainly pick one up on the way out. So please do join us for all five uh, portions of this series. And we'd also encourage you to sign up via our aforementioned brilliant website because we'd really like to get to a sense of who's coming, how many people we can accommodate, and, and all of that fabulous stuff as well. So now a quick, a quick word about the reason for the series. Um, how we manage water in New Orleans affects virtually everything that's important in this city, from the infrastructure around us, streets, pipes, uh, buildings, their foundations, the, the foundations of uh, residential as well as commercial buildings, everything that, that's, that's around us. You can see our streets need help, our sidewalks need help, a lot of, a lot of the public infrastructure in the city is obviously in need of, of help. And so, you know, there's, there's some ways of doing this. There's a traditional sort of infrastructure that we have around us and that we're continuing to invest in, but there are also ways of actually holding on to water and reintroducing it into the soil. Subsidence or the sinking of soil is one of the biggest problems we face in this region. And ways of holding on to that water are key not only to stopping the sinking of this area, but to preserving the very expensive infrastructure in which we're investing again and again and again. So this series is meant to talk about that. It's also meant to introduce us to best practices from throughout the United States. We have heard many wonderful things about what the Dutch have done, but the objections that we've also heard time and time again have been that, well, the Dutch, you know, Holland is a, is a European country. The Dutch have a way of, of approaching these problems through national taxation. We are a relatively poor city, but we wanted to 
respond to those objections constructively by saying, look, there are other cities like Philadelphia, like Milwaukee. These are, these are ostentatiously uh, non-grandiose cities, for lack of a better term, that have been able to do some really progressive stuff in progressive water management. And this is something we wanted to point out, that it doesn't necessarily take a Beverly Hills, the budget of a Beverly Hills, to be a progressive leader in integrated water management. So that's the reason for this series at the end of the day. And so now it's my great pleasure to give you, to introduce to you uh, our three speakers for today. Two of whom most of you probably already know very well. Mark Davis, we'll start with him, is a senior research fellow at Tulane University Law School and director of the Institute on Water Resources Law and Policy. The mission of the Institute is to foster an appreciation of the importance of water resources and the vital roles that law and policy play in their management and stewardship. Prior to the Institute, he served 14 years as the executive director of the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, where he was extensively involved in shaping laws, policies, and programs at the state and federal level dealing with restoration and stewardship of coastal ecosystems. He has practiced law in Washington, D.C. and Chicago. We won't hold that against him, though. He has also been an adjunct professor at ITT, at IIT, rather, Chicago Kent School of Law and Indiana University School of Business in Indianapolis. He has a JD with honors from Indiana University and an MLT from the Georgetown University Law Center. So a quick round of applause for Mark, and thank you for joining us. And of course, we couldn't begin a series about water without having a Noah amongst us. And so I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Noah Garrison. With, with great gratitude, Noah, Noah Garrison is an attorney with the uh, National Water Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Noah joined NRDC in 2007, and his areas emphasis, of emphasis include legal, policy, and technical issues related to urban runoff and stormwater, green infrastructure and low-impact development, implementation and their relationship to water supply, energy use, and climate change, enforcement of the Clean Water Act and California Port of Cologne Act, groundwater supply and management, and impacts of dams and other flow diversion projects on river systems. Noah is a graduate of Wesleyan University and the University of California at Los Angeles School of Law with a specialization in public interest law and policy. Noah also holds an MS in Geological Sciences from the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he served as lecturer in 2004. And last, but certainly not least, Jeff Thomas. Uh, who is a New Orleans attorney with over 15 years of law and policy experience focused on environmental protection, economic development, disaster recovery, renewable energy, and increasing public participation in government. As principal of Thomas Strategies LLC, Jeff helps facilitate public-private financing and policy solutions to spur resilient and sustainable community and economic development. Jeff recently coordinated the New Orleans Citizen Sewer, Water, and Drainage System Reform Task Force, which was created at the request of the City of New Orleans to recommend existing opportunities to improve the city's water and flood protection systems, including means for reducing pollution runoff and reducing subsidence by safely absorbing more stormwater within public spaces. Jeff's local experience also includes service in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, a special assistant to the New Orleans Office of Recovery and Development Administration. Um, Jeff's community efforts have been recognized with several honors, including, uh, but not limited to, the New Orleans City Business Magazine's Leadership and Law Award and designation among Gambit's magazine's 40 Under 40 in the New Orleans region. Jeff is a 2001 graduate of Tulane Law School. So a quick round of applause for all of our guests, please. So, um, without further preamble, I'm going to present you with Mark Davis, who, ex who will explain the context in which we find ourselves. And I think an important, it would help if I could see you, I think an important thing to say about this is what the, the point of this first session, essentially, is to set the context for water management in New Orleans. What are the challenges, what are the opportunities that we face as both a city and a region? So without further ado, Mark Davis. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Um, it's really exciting to be here and to see a, a room full of people actually interested in, in a topic like this. Um, and not only, but a series. Because I think it's important to understand that we're not here just to talk about things like stormwater management. Because quite frankly, the notion of treating stormwater as apart from other water. Speak up. 
Um, am I, my mic is my mic on. No. Ah. And in conclusion, I'd like to say, <laughs> is that better? Can you? All right. Um, since they're doing this for broadcast, I didn't want to sound like I was, you know, leading the charge. Um, as I was saying, it's important when we're here to talk about stormwater challenges that we realize that stormwater is not com something completely distinct from water as a whole. In fact, the notion that stormwater is treated distinctly from other forms of water is more a matter of our perception, how we've chosen to manage it, rather than its actual character and its potential value. And I think it's also vitally important, as Marco suggested, that it's not something that you manage to a national or international standard, because the, the way the way precipitation, rain, snow works varies from place to place. It's been terrific working as closely as I've had the opportunity to with folks from the Netherlands. But when we explain to them what it's like to live in a place that gets five feet of rain a year, it changes the conversation. If you talk to them about storms that you know, have winds of 170 miles an hour and storm surges of 30 feet. That's not the world they live in. So we can, we can learn from each other. We can emulate one another's, you know, levels of commitment. But the way we manage these resources, I think, has to be rooted in more intrinsic values. And that's what I want to begin with, because I think it's vi essential to realize that we're talking fundamentally about water. Not just storm water, not just you know, rain water, not just drinking water, river water, lake water. We're talking about water. And water, as you probably have all guessed, is one of the few things that's absolutely essential to life. It's essential to commerce. It's essential to culture. And for most of human experience, all major civilizations built around water. It's really only in the last 50 to 60 years that we've seen, not only in this country but globally, you know, the, the absolutely bold and defiant act of putting population centers with millions and millions of people in places with gallons and gallons of water. And I think we have to understand that the way we manage water is not normally about managing water, it's about managing land and opportunity. And it's about power and possibility. So we're not dealing with water as a chemical thing. We're dealing with it as a driver of prosperity and a driver of risk. And those are the things that cut through water management of all sorts in all times. And I think we have to appreciate the fact that the manner in which water is, is managed in New Orleans or Louisiana it may have things in common with our sister states, but we are in a different position than any of them. And you also need to know that while we've increasingly come up with federal standards for how you manage various water attributes, including storm water, that most water law and most water management and most of the reasons we fear or prize water are local, creatures of state law and state culture. Over the, again, over the last 50 to 60 years, we were able to actually put people in places that no one ever had, to grow crops in places that no one ever had, and use our technology and our innovative capacities to command water to appear. I thought I was being teleported. <laughs> My real purpose is to get the kinks out for these guys. <laughs> there are a few more surprises I haven't told them about. But I think it's absolutely essential to realize that the era of easy, cheap water is over. And that for all places in the United States, not just Louisiana, the relationship between communities and economies and ecologies and water 
is going to have to be more holistic. It's going to have to be managed more purposefully. And you can't manage it based on yesterday's expectations or yesterday's science, and certainly not yesterday's law. That's water in America. It's at a crossroads, a place where, in fact, there is not enough water for every place that wants to grow to grow. If you compare notes, and I'm sure Noah can do some of this for us, you realize that places that have grown incredibly prosperous in the last 50 years, if you talk to their water managers, they're at, they're at or beyond the horizon of water availability, yet they still plan to grow. It's not an unreasonable thing for them to do, but there are, there are actual physical and practical limits as to where water can be. And we've already seen interstate competition most recently in the United States Supreme Court two weeks ago between Oklahoma and Texas in a case that also implicated Louisiana. There's a separate case between Texas and New Mexico. So if you're not, by the way, if you're not personally being sued by Texas, I'm sorry, you're nobody in the water world. Um, New Orleans obviously has a special relationship with water. You know, it's always been a place, you know, that you know, it's, it's both a, a work of wonder and, and water. It was not a mistake to put the city here, contrary to some things you may read. It's here because of a relationship to water, a river and oceans. It was a place where continental commerce could meet global commerce. If you go too much, much, you know, much north of Baton Rouge, it's a different river. It's a different river hydrologically. It's a different river geologically. It's one of the reasons subsidence is an issue here in ways that it isn't in other parts of the state. It's because we essentially live in the delta. They live next to the delta. And it's one of the reasons large ships can get to Baton Rouge, but barges come down to Baton Rouge. These are things that have to be understood if you're going to manage water holistically because stormwater, in particular, is a vital component of how you can manage risk and optimize opportunity. The challenge of managing subsidence, and if you, I presume you all know this, but I'll go ahead and say it in case there's someone who isn't from here, uh, other than Noah, who clearly has studied this extensively, noted. and that is that New Orleans was not founded as a below sea level city. We created a below sea level city by how we pumped, how we drained. Think about it. Lake Pontchartrain is an arm of the Gulf of Mexico. If we were eight feet below, we would have been part of Lake Pontchartrain. We built the bowl. There were reasons for it. But when we did it, we didn't understand necessarily groundwater hydrology. And when you with withdraw too much water, you sink the city. And sinking the city is what drives rain risk. That's why we have stormwater challenges that go, don't go away, because every new pump station in some way tends to create tomorrow's subsidence and tomorrow's flood risk. If you're not managing the water holistically to manage elevations and risk, then you're actually in a losing game. These are the kinds of things that traditional water managers haven't had to face. They're going to have to. After all, I mean, stormwater risk is int you know, intimately linked to flood insurance risk today. <coughs> and anyone who thinks that you can have a city without insurance or an economy without insurance and capital investment is living in a different world than I. I think what we're going to have to see is a a shift in the way New Orleans, in particular, approaches water management. And it's an approach that can both be informed by how others elsewhere in the country do it, and, and there's a wide range of you know, good case studies and horror stories to borrow from. But we can also borrow from our own past. We, again, need to realize that we didn't finished the bowl until we got the Corps of Engineers to build the hurricane protection levees around 
the city on the lakeside. We didn't build pump stations in, in the middle of the city because we weren't smart enough to put them on the lake. That was the edge of development at the time. We also have to realize that the water management system that we had in New Orleans and that allowed us to become one of the largest, most prosperous cities in the United States into the mid part of the 20th century was built locally with local investment serviced by a local rate base. The idea that anyone can create a water management system, stormwater or otherwise, based upon external investment from the federal government or intergalactic in intervention doesn't realize what the competition for those dollars is going to be, and in fact already is. We actually managed water more holistically, rec recognizing that it was the reason for us to be here, but it was also the reason that we had risks that we had to deal with. Going forward, there are five elements that I think we can look, you know, borrow from others and from our own past that can perhaps point the way. The first is capacity. And that is that every critical element of water management, including uh, stormwater, has to, in fact, be someone's responsibility. If you look around the agencies that administer our water resources, you'll find that big chunks of it are missing. No one manages groundwater. There are places where between when water hits someone's roof and it gets to a catch basin, it's nobody's responsibility. When it comes to designing streets, you know, we design them to carry traffic, not to help water percolate. We essentially are building streets to someone else's industry standard, not to our own sustainability standard, and at great repetitive cost to ourselves. And I would also suggest from a civic standpoint, if you can't find someone whose job it is to manage the resource in a sane way, it must be ours to make it happen. Secondly, resources. It will take dollars, it will take time, it will take human capital of the right sorts. Those are the kinds of things that, again, you know, New Orleans and South Louisiana once took great pride in. It's one of the things that I think we still have you know, an abundance of talent in, but we have to recognize that we're still largely managing yesterday's challenges, not tomorrow's, not even today's. It will take commitment because success comes from not beginning something but finishing it. And it's a recognition that if we're not committed to the sustainability of this system and the stewardship of its waters, why on earth would anyone else be? Continuity. This is not a project. The CELA program is not a federal project that when finished will leave us in good shape for all time. Continuity is reflects the dynamic nature of water and human society. It's an ongoing thing, and if we're not planning to manage it that way, we can expect to be managed by that resource. Finally, flexibility, and that is things change. Some expected, many unexpected. But if our plans are not designed to reflect that flexibility, water is a very, very difficult thing to contain. It's absolutely essential that we respect that fundamental nature. So when I look at the future, well, the, what I can, I think, fairly tell you is that we're about to enter an era more akin to the, the water era that existed really before the 1930s, and that is one where proximity to water or, you know, a security in water supply and you know, effectiveness of water management will determine who grows and who prospers. As I mentioned, there is not enough water to go around under today's current growth and management practices. It's not a mystery that places like Nevada, California, <coughs> Texas, Colorado, New Mexico have problems. They're committed to finding the water, sometimes at the expense of their neighbor. But it's also just as true at places like Atlanta, Orlando, Miami, Norfolk, are also facing their own limitations. They're already at or beyond the, 
you know, the, the security zone of a sure water supply. They're, in fact, looking at some of the same waters for their futures that we count upon, assume will be available to us for all of the needs, whether it's ecologic, navigation, water supply, you name it. Entire river systems are going to come into play, because they already are. The places that have the best attitude and the greatest shared commitment in how you manage water, and stormwater is perhaps a great place to begin, are the ones that are going to have the best shot at doing well in the next century. Stormwater in particular, because by and large, we've come, you know, we've come from a time when everyone stored stormwater because that's what you bathed with, that's what you drank, that's what you used to water your gardens. That was the cistern era. We didn't have uh, a mass distribution system. There are good reasons we left it, but there are not good reasons to disparage the values of managing and storing and slowing the flow of water. We need to become more purpose-driven and less compliance-driven. Compliance regulations are an important hammer and incentive to do things that need to be done, but they don't define what is a wise choice. They merely tell you what is the required choice. So I will tell you that I think the places that will do well are the places that do match capacity, resources, commitment, continuity, and flexibility. And I say that I think it can work because I've seen it work elsewhere in some doses, and we've seen it work here. And there's nothing new to this way of thinking. In fact, if you go back to 1620, to France, Sir Francis Bacon, in many ways the, the father of the modern scientific method and the modern university notion, he observed that nature to be commanded must first be obeyed. It's something, I think, simple but easily forgotten. And it's something I do not think we can afford to forget any longer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. That was excellent. And now um, Jeff Thomas is going to um, lead our conversation. Please hold your questions until the very end when we'll um, have an opportunity for everyone to speak. And then write them on a $50 bill and send them up. <laughs> And PowerPoint and all that. Here comes the, the Doctor Who intervention. <clears throat> Until it's warming up. Oh, it is. I've got a little light coming on. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, for coming today. Hold on. Yeah. I'm a roamer, so I, they're going to be in the Take with me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Uh, a lot of familiar faces in here. A lot of a lot of fellow advocates, and you know, in some way preaching to the choir. So I. Consider this partly a call to arms for those of you that are uh, in lockstep with us. Uh, and thank you for a lot of uh, uh, public leaders here, the, you know, people in local government, city plan commission, sewage and water board, NORA, the city, uh, also in attendance. Uh, my presentation is really about making water local. You know, all, like politics, all water has to be local in terms of how you manage it. And, and what I want to try to get into is what we see as the real-time challenges and opportunities for managing this thing called water. Uh, and first, I kind of dispel this, this notion of water management. I, I'm an environmental lawyer, and I, I've been in profession for a while, and I remember a good friend of mine, Priska Weems, who introduced me to water management a few years ago, I, and Oliver Hauck, too, who's you know, my guru in environmental law. We both kind of stared quizzically at her when she used that phrase, water management. It was lost on us for a little bit, and she explained it well. But I think you know, that we don't necessarily do ourselves a favor by just leaving that definition out there without explaining it more fully. When you're a city in a bowl, water management is flood protection, right? I think to build on what Mark was saying, you, we, I see drainage in the city as not just something that we do to get water out of the way when it rains, but really it's a third line of defense 
when it comes to protecting us from flooding. Right? We have coastal restoration. Keep that water that, that in, the, in the sea as far away as possible. Uh, to the extent it comes at us during a storm, let's build great levees that, that we can build around that perimeter of the bowl. But then we're the third rainiest city in America. You know, only by three inches, Mobile has us. And, and so we have to go against gravity at all times to get all that rainwater out of here. And if we don't successfully do that, it's self-evident. We flood. Moreover, we're subsiding. And so the, as the bowl gets deeper, it's breaking the straws, the very pipes that we use to get rid of that rainwater. And so we're, we're really in a situation of consequence right now. Because uh, for all the effort and time we're putting into coastal restoration and levee enhancement, we have yet to really awaken to this idea of flood protection from that which falls down on us. This idea of water management has to be seen, I think, more pressingly as flood protection. And I think that way we might be a little bit more further motivated. I, I'm going to go through here what I see is, uh, was on my eye-opening experience. Uh, as part of a mission I was given about a year and a half ago to, the mayor asked uh, business leaders to advise him on uh, ways to improve the water systems of the city incident to a proposed rate increase with the Sewage and Water Board. And we got into all aspects of water. Uh, we looked at the Sewage and Water Board's main operations, the power system, the drinking water, the sewage treatment. And we got to this issue of drainage. And we realized, wow, this is so much more beyond what we think is just about Sewage and Water Board. This is, this is a citywide issue. And again, when you're in that bowl, it's not just about how many pipes you have and are they working, are the catch basins clogged. It's a, are, are, are we enlisting every piece of public space that we might have available to us and our own private properties in the service of flood protection? And what we found was really kind of a sobering current assessment, but then more positively, some motivating opportunities. This, was a, this came from a briefing we were given by the city. Uh, they, had did, they did a drainage master plan study and in 2011, it was finished. And uh, what they found was that th this is flood risk. This is a model of downtown and uh, uptown. We're about right here, right where we are now. Darker the blue to deeper the water. That's a 10-year storm event. That means one in 10 chance every year of this happening, which is about eight inches of rain falling in 24 hours. By, by uh, context, five-year storms, which are I think roughly five or six inches of rain in 24 hours. We had two of them happen in December of 2009. So this, it's statistical. It's not like you know, bank on this once a decade. It can happen at any given time and then happen again. Uh, but what you have here is this is the existing system as we think it is now. Assuming it's functional, all the pipes that are out there, we get on average during that kind of event pretty sobering flooding, 15 inches on average. 61% of the city streets covered with at least six inches of, of rain. Now, this is not the kind of rain, the flooding that, God forbid, we saw after Hurricane Katrina. This, this, this can come and go, but you know, as, as if you're thinking of yourself as a homeowner or business, two feet of rain in your you know, business or home, whether it's there for a second or a day or a week, it's, it's, it's not something you want, right? So this, this is our starting point as a conversation for water management, for the idea of better drainage, better flood protection, in, in New Orleans. <coughs> we, uh, we then dig, dug deep, if you will, further to look at what, the, what is that that's, uh, drainage system today. Uh, there's actually two drainage systems out there servicing one city. The pink pipes uh, represented here is the sewage and water board pipes. That's, that's the large stuff. Anything 36 inches in diameter or larger, including the box culverts underneath the major, major uh, thoroughfares of the city, the large neutral grounds the open air canals that we see, and the pumping stations. Uh, I think more conspicuous, but, but probably more important to getting this right, is all this stuff here. This is two-thirds of the system, 1,200 miles of drainage pipe, owned and operated by the city's Department of Public Works. Take a look at the stats here. Again, as a starting point, 235 miles of pipe here, 1,200, almost 1,300 miles there. A 2013 operating budget from Sewage and Water Board for their stuff, at about 36 and a half million. The city's budget, 1.8 million. And that's, that's not just for those blue pipes, that's for all the catch basins, it's for the surface above the pipes. It's, it's, not, it's uh, all things street, above and below. And then the city, uh, in that drainage master plan, did a cost estimate of what it would take if you did a pipe only solution to try to get the city to a point where 
we were protected for it from a 10-year event so that instead of having two plus feet of, of flooding in some areas, at a minimum, you'd have six inches of water and it would go away. <clears throat> to do that, it would cost about $3.1 billion to get those sewage and water, uh, DPW pipes up to, up to speed and about $1.6 billion for sewage and water. All right, so that's, that's a non-starter, right? That's, that's five plus billion dollars to try to do a pipe only solution if you're gonna do this in a way that protects the city from that kind of 10 year flood event. Which I, you know, has, has been explained to us by engineers is not a gold standard. Uh, it's, it's something you, you should expect. Biloxi has a 25 year flood standard right now. They're, they're able to accommodate a 25 year flood event. That's, a, that's even bigger. So uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a reasonable target. The problem with what's unreasonable is to think you could do it by just fixing all the pipes that are out there. You know, it's, we don't have enough money to do that. Moreover, we're not, as, as Mark was alluding to about the idea of capacity, this idea of governing all aspects of water, in some ways we do it a little too well. Yeah, we, there are no less than seven governmental entities that regulate some aspect of a raindrop from the time it hits your rooftop to the time it's pumped to the lake. And each of, the, each of those entities, are, some of them are separate, some of them are within the city government, they, they don't necessarily coordinate, they don't necessarily have a common mission, they're not bound by common ordinances, executive orders. <clears throat> and so this, leads, this, this also lends itself to a certain amount of dysfunction and, and, and making it more difficult to try to do uh, a, a, a more thorough repair of this. I'm pulling right from the headlines, for example, one of the issues in front of us over the next year or so is the idea of a drainage fee. And that, we're, we're not alone. There's about 2,200 cities in America that have drainage fees. This idea of based on your property size and the amount of water you help put into the system, you, might, you, you would pay a fee to help protect the system. Two separate systems, two separate fees. Will, will that fee go to all this stuff or not? These are all open-ended questions before us. This is an opportunity in time we as a citizenry really have to grab hold of and make sure it's done right. So that's the sobering assessment. Now, we also then had an opportunity to look at what might be the real-time opportunities. The source fuel that might actually be out there to start putting a down deposit on some of these ideas of water management. This, the Dutch model, the, 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 the things that other cities in America increasingly are doing more and more of. And as it turns out, we have, we have some real opportunities here. Uh, there is a lot of money that's being put into service in this city as we speak. Katrina-related money uh, on top of general fund money that the city has. And while it certainly doesn't get you to the ideal place that a city in a bowl near water should get to someday, it certainly is a meaningful down deposit. And I think can really start shifting us away from building like we're on a hill and instead build like, we're, like what we are, the city in a bowl. I'm gonna go through these uh, briefly, but just to kind of give them a highlight here, the neutral grounds that are being dug up under, under the SELA program. And we'll get to that in a minute. The FEMA money and other, other federal dollars from Katrina are still yet to be spent in design and construction for streets and public parks. $247 million in federal hazard mitigation dollars, some of which, a lot of which, in fact, will be going to repair the power system at the Sewage Water Board, but roughly about $100 million that's left to be decided upon. We see that as an opportunity, coupled particularly with the Restore Act dollars that will come from the oil spill, to really do, again, a down deposit meaningfully on this idea of, of flood protection inside the bowl. And then our ongoing government. We, we, we have zoning, we have policies that incentivize, we give away monies, we give away other incentives to lure commercial development, to incentivize blight reuse, to do affordable housing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. This idea that uh, in addition to all the other policy aims, job creation, disadvantaged businesses, other, other things that rightfully we try to incorporate into any of those incentive programs, let's ask ourselves, are, are you helping us be safer from flooding. That should be one of the asks, I think. If any time government might give out an incentive or otherwise require something of someone who's building something in the city. All right, so briefly, uh, the neutral grounds. Now, I, if you're uptown, you, you see it every day. It's gonna be with us for a while. Uh, on Claiborne, on Napoleon, and ultimately on Louisiana, on Dwyer Avenue in, uh, in, in the uh, east. We're digging up these neutral grounds to put in or expand these massive underground culverts. That's the back end of the system. Sewage and Water Board does a pretty good job of draining water once it gets to them, right? 
They have, a, they have a capacity to take the Ohio River out in a day, 29 billion gallons of water, right? And it's through, yeah, it's amazing, through, through a lot of because of these massive culverts, and they're expanding them yet still, right? This is like building a, a superhighway, a great interstate system. Our concern is, do the on-ramps work? Do they exist to get the water to them? And let's start with the land we have before we even get to the issue of the smaller pipes leading to the big pipes to the bigger pipes. What are we doing with the land? Not lost on anybody who lives here, the neutral ground are, are the, often the high points in those neighborhoods. It's where people put their cars when it floods, right? I mean, it's, it's counterintuitive that all this, that, that place, that neutral ground of green earth is higher than your home and business. It's sobering. So if we're going to dig it all up and, and expand and make these culverts, it comes down to the question, what are you going to do with that dirt that you're going to put back on top of there? Are you going to reestablish the dome? Or are we going to do something more innovative, more sustainable, more protective of the, of the surrounding city? It's hard to see that in the light here, but we don't have to look very far for possible good ideas. These are neutral grounds that have been designed to be not concave, but con you know, convex, concave. It would be basins to hold water. This is, a, this is on veterans. All right? so, I just took this last week during that big rainstorm. Hard to see here, but there's big pools of water in there, surrounded by cypress trees that are on the, on the outside so the roots don't compromise the underground drainage system. It's holding water. It's being sucked up by those trees. This is going to be a decision opportunity for us when we dig these up and decide how we can put them back. Moreover, we have in, on Canal Street, you take this road and just head up to where it intersects, where, uh, where 610 goes over it, and there's a place called the Sunken Garden. It's beautiful. It's not something major. It's not canyon. It's hard to see here, but it's, it's about a depth of about a foot and a half, two feet from the road. And not coincidentally, when it rains, water goes in there. Right? That's less water running off the high point into your yard and your business and your car, staying where it, where it fell and, eventually, and, and, and going into the soil. You know, so the win-win here, if you think about it this way, this was presented to me, <coughs> drainage for dummies. A good engineering friend of mine finally got it through to me. You know, we, this is the high point, right? This is by the river. Right? Water starts here, goes to the low point. That's why it's flooding there during a 10-year event. It has to get past there. It gets to the pumps all the way out to the lake. All along the way, we're sinking, right? So the idea is that's bad. Let's, let's prevent that from happening. And how you do that is you keep the sponge wet to a certain extent at all times. So that's one reason to, to do retention in your neutral grounds. And we'll talk a little bit more about park space and streets. The whole, another thing is getting through these pipes, you know, it's all, it's all about energy. It's, it's a misnomer to call it drainage. Drainage means that you just put it in a pipe and gravity takes it somewhere. We suck it up. As, as my engineering friend told me, it's not drainage, it's pressure. And it's, that's energy, that's money. We have to pay, we have to use vast sums of energy to suck that uh, water all the more past pipes with holes in it. And so the, another advantage to detaining water is it slows it down. It gives, the, it gives the pumps more time to work to pump that water out in a holding area. So you, you, you strategically look at your assets in the city and you know if this is high ground and we're digging up neutral grounds, not a bad place to keep water at bay for a little bit before it makes its way to, into the pipes. Well, it just so happens there are a lot of construction projects to be happening over the next few years in these areas. And, and so the one thing we, we put the clarion call out to the city and the local government is don't blow this opportunity. Take advantage of this, this win. This is a great victory. Beyond the neutral grounds, where dirt's going to be put on top of them for better or for worse, we also have all our streets. You know, we, we did a, uh, we as this task force, we, we requested from FEMA uh, a tabulation of the money that Orleans Parish had as of late February, dedicated to street repairs that it hadn't yet spent on design or construction. It was about $190 million. Right? So to us, that's, that's our starting point. On top of that, there's HUD money and there's Department of Transportation money that you get through the Regional Planning Commission. There's other monies. Suffice to say that there's a pretty impressive docket of street projects over the next three to five years that are all opportunities in, 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 in front of us. And again, it's, it's, it's incremental stuff. I, I'm, we're, I think sometimes we, we get into these dialogues and we scare ourselves by the grandest picture we can possibly create. And maybe the Netherlands sometimes is a little too ironically paralyzing because you know, you, there you have this country that's been able to dedicate large amounts of money to, to that s effort. Here, let's do it incrementally and get it done where we can. So, this, this, again, this is off of Claiborne two weeks ago during one of our spring rainstorms. 
the idea would be if you're going to dig up a street using FEMA money, don't build it like you're on a hill. Take advantage, know where you are, and, and work with FEMA, who, if you follow the federal government's policy mandates, suggest all that, yeah, we should be using that money for more sustainability. You should be doing it for, with, 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 to uh, heighten water values. Here, let's add bioswales. The idea that you put vegetation lining, lining a, a, a curb or, or the street so that water, when it runs off of a property, before it gets to that fractured drain system, goes into this area that's caught up and sucked in by vegetation. You start doing this a few blocks at a time with the FEMA funding that you have to redo these street projects. You start incrementally get, turning the ship. You start incrementally making the city be what it needs to be for the future. You also make it look pretty. You know, I mean, there's added value to this. Not only is it functional to protect from flooding, but it adds that aesthetic property value to, to a community. And you have to hire people to do that stuff. You know, it's a, it, it, it becomes uh, an innovative economic sector to itself when you have landscape architects and engineering firms that are out there doing these innovative things. Instead of having them go to Milwaukee and Kansas City to make their bones, they should do it here, right? <clears throat> Similarly with park space. So, you know, less, less, less of opportunity there in terms of street mileage. But nonetheless, right in front of us, we have parks. You know, we, we, we examine what we have already. We've got Audubon, not city-owned. But the water from Audubon, it drains out onto St. Charles. I mean, it's, it's completely counterintuitive. Lafitte Greenway, yet in front of us, an opportunity. It, this, it, it, contrib it contributes to this. This is why it, water comes off of that greenway and goes into the surrounding community, exacerbating flooding that already exists. So the idea would be, again, opportunity ahead. Don't have to make it the, the Venice of, of public parks. But how, if you're going to dig up earth, it's all about how you put it back. You know, grade it so that water goes into a park, not out. This is stuff that can be done on a big scale and a small scale. It doesn't have to be done completely. I mean, I, this is a rendering from one of our allies, Dana Brown Associates. Uh, it's similar to a concept making its way through the bureaucracy now in, in Dwyer Avenue. There's been uh, an effort to push for something similar in Lafitte Greenway. But again, you know, th this is something that collectively as a, as a community we have to ask for. Anytime there's park improvements done, we should be asking ourselves, in addition to, as Mark was pointing out, providing that base service of recreation, is it also helping us be safer from flooding? That's a, that's a question we have to ask ourselves anytime we build something in, in this city in a bowl, particularly when you're government and you've got money in hand to make that project happen. <clears throat> and then, you know, on us, right? I mean, it's, it's not just about streets and, and public spaces and neutral grounds. Water begins at a rooftop and, and runs from there. And we, we need to shift the paradigm here. You know, I, I, I'm going to pick a little bit here, but, you know, we, 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 have, a, we have a big uh, development coming downtown, Costco. It's a great fanfare. This is a great thing for, for, this, for the city. It's a great development. It's a big business. It's going to make money. It's going to employ people. It's the right thing at the right time for this community. I think where we blew it, though, is that, uh, you know, Costco is a major retailer that has, as I like to think of it, dra design drawers, if you will, for how to do parking lots, right? They, and depending on how they're at, what they're asked to do, they'll, they'll, they'll come to bear, right? I think we, we, fearful that we were going to lose them, asked, just said, give us the baseline. In fact, here's 200 extra spots. I mean, it's, it's, our own city plan commission recommended it be smaller than what we ultimately gave them. And it's right next, it's one of the lowest parts of the city, right next to a drainage canal. This is a Costco parking lot in Nevada. And this is a bioswale and, and retention area. And they, Costco didn't do it because they wanted to. They did it because they had to. Because in Meadow, Truckee Meadows, Nevada, they have stormwater retention rules that say, hey, if, welcome. Create, you know, create jobs and, and make business here. But don't hurt us. We're going to build that big parking lot. Here's what we need from you. That's a legitimate ask from a city in a bowl to anybody who wants to do business here. And we shouldn't be afraid to ask for it. We need it. This is how we protect ourselves. And I think good corporate neighbors get it. They'll do it because they are doing it elsewhere. <clears throat> Similarly, let's, let's enable us, the, the homeowner. You know, this is, this is what they call a rain barrel. It's like a small garbage can. You know, so imagine, let's incentivize that. You know, if, I, if I'm giving blight, blighted properties available at auction or a, a grants for affordable housing to developers, maybe one way to incentivize, yet still, 
attached to that money is what are you going to do to retain water on that property so that it doesn't go off into the street and further compromise the drainage system so that you can store it and water those plants with it. These are things that are being done. It's like a, one of the old blue laws. You know, I mean, it's, if you look at state law, uh, rain barrels are illegal because of mosquitoes and yellow fever and various other 19th century ailments that we you know, don't have to worry about. <clears throat> so let's, let's turn the law around. But even better, let's, let's get out there and incentivize these kind of practices. There's a lot of people that are doing this on their own clandestinely creating their own uh, recycling things. In fact, this building itself, if you look outside this courtyard, is wonderfully done to capture the water that falls and reuse it. And so let's grab a hold of this and not just hope that people do the right thing, but incentivize, outright mandate it. The City Planning Commission right now is working on a, on a, a zoning code chapter dedicated to stormwater management. That's a great thing. It's a big, it's a big opportunity to advance this whole cause forward. And it's going to come before city, uh, the city planning commission sometime this year, and then ultimately city council. And that's that's a moment of leadership opportunity for all of us. We have to be in in, char in front of that. We have to see it as an opportunity, not as an impediment. And we got to make sure it works, and we got to get out there and, and explain it. So it, this is me in a nutshell. I mean, this is taking stormwater management and trying to put you know trying to put the sexy back in drainage. I mean, it's trying to trying to take the real base functions of government, you know, the projects that we're going to do, the street projects, the sidewalks, the parks, the things that you and I do in our businesses and try to enlist them in the service of flood protection. Because in the city of Bowl, you have no choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. And now, Noah Garrison. I want to I I thank uh, uh, Mark and, and Jeff for starting this off. Uh, both terrific speeches in the right and also really helped to set up my talk. Um, so always thankful when someone leads nicely into my, my talk and I can uh, thank them for the introduction and having to, instead of having to give it to myself. Uh, apparently I have to speak closer. Um, so I want to start from, from sort of a national perspective and talk about the, the practices that Jeff is talking about and the, the, the issues that are being raised that Mark is talking about aren't just a concern for New Orleans. We recognize certainly there are unique or at least maybe increased challenges the New Orleans faces with stormwater. But these are issues that are dealt with around the country, around, uh, you know, around North America, and in some cases around the world. And uh, any number of cities or counties or states are having success in using different practices to address this, particularly using green infrastructure or low impact development as a, a different means of managing stormwater runoff. Um, so I'm gonna start with an example of, of where the problem comes from, uh, from close to where I live. This is uh, the Chino Basin which is an area east of Los Angeles, um, uh, and sort of a, an indication of the land use practices over the past century or so. And if you look at this map, the uh, green and, and blue and sort of gray areas are agrarian or open space or, or agricultural practice. They're, they're basically undeveloped area. Those little red dots scattered throughout the area are urban development, pavement uh, uh, buildings. Um, and over time, we've done a lot to transform our landscape in this country. So over the past century, and it's even worse now, we have completely changed our landscape. We've gone from open space, trees, plants, soil, uh, areas where when rain falls, it soaks into the ground, it infiltrates, it reaches groundwater, or it's taken up by plants and evaporated. Very little of it actually forms as runoff to a system now where everything is paved over. And when it rains, uh, the rain has nowhere to go. It flows downhill and it picks up everything in its path. It picks up uh, automobile waste, oils, metals, uh, 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 pathogens, bacteria, uh, dog poop, trash, anything that's sitting on the street gets picked up by stormwater, it gets taken to the nearest storm drain, dumped into the storm sewer system, and often dumped out into the nearest water with little or no treatment. So this is Los Angeles today, and the red areas, this is a, a GIS map of all of Southern California, the red areas are impervious surface, and we have 60 to 80 mile wide swaths of land that are now paved surface that's impervious, and so stormwater or rainfall doesn't go into the ground, it doesn't get taken by plants, it just flows downhill. So I started with this example from Southern California, but this is New Orleans, and this is a beautiful city. It's known for its gardens, but you guys have a lot of pavement here, and you're developing, and you're building, and you're building more and more, and you're building more and more pavement. And if you look at the, the street next to us, or the examples that, that Jeff gave, when it rains, that water has nowhere to go anymore. 
It goes to the lowest point. It floods areas. It comes in, in quicker floods because it instantly generates this runoff, whereas before trees or grass might have delayed the, the sort of the, the discharge of, of uh, rainfall, it just instantly hits pavement and starts flowing downhill. And so we get sort of the, the stormwater trifecta. We get flooding, we get uh, pollution at our, at our uh, uh, recreational waters, and we get just pollution overall. Okay, well, how do we deal with that? The, the paradigm that we've used to deal with stormwater runoff over the last you know, 60 years or longer in this country has been when we build, put it on a pipe, get it away from development as quickly as possible. And, and that's, there are unique challenges to that in uh, uh, New Orleans. You have very shallow groundwater here in a lot of areas. You have areas that will flood with rainfall almost instantly that you have to pump out. But it's really not that different from the challenges that any other parts of the country face, is that when it rains, what do you do with the runoff? Because if you don't address it in some fashion, it's going to flood. It's, we get flash floods in Los Angeles if we don't deal with the stormwater, or in Pennsylvania. This, this photo, uh, the photo on the previous page, excuse me, let me go back, that was taken in Pennsylvania just a couple of years ago. It happens in the Pacific Northwest. It happens in, uh, in the Southeast. Um, same thing that we have pollution issues virtually anywhere in the country that there's stormwater that we don't address at property. I like that I have a light show going on here. This is kind of neat. This is sort of a, I'll, I'll start playing some Pink Floyd. We can all just hang out for a while. Um, uh, at any rate, right, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we started looking around the country really as, as, as we started looking at, okay, we, we have to address this more holistically. We have to be looking at stormwater not just as how do we get rid of the water, but how do we do it in a, in a fashion that makes sense for our cities? How do we do it in a fashion that provides other benefits that maybe we put the water itself to use? And we started looking around the country to see what other cities were doing. And we found that this kind of an amazing profusion of, of this green infrastructure on the country, and it, it fits with a, a statement that the EPA has said recently, which is green infrastructure works everywhere. It absolutely does. So the, the mindset that that you may have that, well, we can't really approach this the same way that the, the Netherlands does. We can't necessarily approach this the same way that Philadelphia does or that Portland does. To a degree, that's true. But it's really not true in the whole because these practices will work for you. You may just have different needs that you have to put them to use for. So I want to start giving examples of what's being done around the country with green infrastructure. And I'll lead that into to sort of how this can help New Orleans. So to start with, we looked at 14 case studies around the country. We, uh, we looked at 14 different cities that had different issues. They had combined sewer overflows. They had stormwater overflows. They had pollution issues. They had water supply issues. They had energy use and park and open space issues. And we looked at how they were using green infrastructure and we found that it's really incredible that these cities are, are on their own leadership, not necessarily being mandated by the federal government or, or by national requirements, but on their own, are really turning to this to solve their own water issues. I'm gonna start with Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia has what I would say probably the most ambitious approach to using green infrastructure and addressing their stormwater problems of any city in the country right now. They have a 25 year plan that is going to vastly transform the city and it's to deal with a combination of combined sewer overflow issues they have. Even really small amounts of rain can completely overwhelm their sanitary sewer systems and you get massive amounts of, of basically raw sewage being dumped into local rivers. But they also have areas that, are, uh, uh, that have real problems with stormwater. This is I feel like there's a poltergeist in here. This is kind of, <laughs> kind of incredible. Um, uh, <laughs> at any rate, um, uh, they, they, they really have, have huge issues here that they're, they're going to completely transform their city. They're going to spend 2.4 billion years, uh, billion dollars, 2.4 billion years. <laughs> stormwater may not be an issue. Um, uh, 2.4 billion dollars over the next 25 years to address stormwater. And what they're going to do is, is this is a, a scene from downtown Philadelphia. They are going to absolutely transform this city. It is, it is going to be a completely different city, uh, city by the time this is done. Um, and as Jeff pointed to, it's going to be a much prettier city. It's going to be green. You are literally going to green the city, but they're going to use things like green roofs, which we'll talk about in a little bit, green streets, uh, a park space. Uh, a, a lot of cities are looking at taking school property because you have large amounts of open space with playing fields, uh, athletic facilities, and using those, all directing stormwater runoff to where it either can be infiltrated into the ground or at least it can be slowed down, slowly evaporated, and prevent it from being a problem in the first instance. Um, they're looking at changing literally one third of their cityscape. So nearly 10,000 acres of Philadelphia is gonna be transformed by this process. Uh, it's ambitious, it's expensive, but in the end, it is going to solve 
major problems for that city and have huge cost benefits as a result. But they're not the only city. So around the country, just a, a couple of examples, and there are dozens and dozens more. The city of Portland is looking at uh, solving huge problems they have with pollution in the Willamette River and with flooding in the city, and they have a, a retention requirement now. So you have to retain the first one inch, uh, excuse me, I take it back, actually uh, 80%, which is about one inch storm, but 80% of your annual runoff has to be retained on site for new development projects, and in some cases, they're looking at retrofitting the existing environment. Toronto, Canada has a mandatory downspout disconnect program. So when, when rain comes and it hits your roof surface, it goes into downspouts and it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, it goes into the nearest storm drain and nobody thinks about it. Uh, Toronto has started a mandatory program that you have to disconnect those downspouts from the city storm sewer system and the runoff run has to be managed by, you know, putting it, percolating it onto uh, open space, lawns, gravel areas where it can slowly infiltrate, where it can be captured and reused, or it can be, you know, just slowly dissipated over time, evaporated. Uh, they also, Toronto also has a mandatory green roof uh, uh, program that buildings over a certain size have to install a green roof. And I'll, I'll get to green roofs again and why they could be a huge benefit for New Orleans in a second. But these are tremendously ambitious programs that a couple of years ago nobody would have considered at all, but now are being used as absolutely the practice that should be mandated and is going to solve the city's problems. Um, Los Angeles, just a, a couple of months ago, uh, Los Angeles County adopted a, a Clean Water Act permit that requires that all new development and redevelopment projects have to retain the 85th percentile storm on site. And it's only about three quarters of inches in coastal California, not nearly the rainfall volume we have here, but there's a huge impact from this. First, um, there's a huge opportunity for Southern California, which is dry and needs water, to put this water to use. They're looking at, at, at not only just new development and redevelopment, but taking vast portions of the county capturing all of the stormwater runoff from the existing built environment, from new development projects, from expansion in, into other areas that aren't developed currently, capturing that water and putting it to use, infiltrating it into the ground for, uh, to recharge groundwater supplies, or just capturing it. They have huge vault systems they're putting in place under parks and recreational areas, and using that water for irrigation, for toilet flushing, actually creating water supply because if you look at uh, the uh, climate projections for California, our water supply picture is not pretty and we have to find new sources of water. So instead of taking this water, billions and billions of gallons a year and dumping it into the, our rivers, dumping it at the beach, creating pollution problems, we're gonna put it to use and we're gonna get ourselves, you know, slowly wean ourselves off of uh, distant projects that bring us water. This is an example of the State Water Project, which supplies water from Northern California about 400 miles through piped systems to Southern California, including putting it over a mountain range to get there. It's the single largest energy user in California, is this project, that we pump hundreds and hundreds of, sorry? Exactly, yeah, absolutely. Uh, being pointed at about 26% of our, our annual energy use. And it's, it's absolutely in that range. Um, it is incredible the amount of water they use to pump this over 3,000 foot mountain ranges and through the desert to get it to Southern California. And it's, to a degree, unnecessary. We're always gonna be reliant on some of these supplies. Most of the water in California is in the north, most of the people are in the south. There's a bit of an issue there. But we, put a, we, we throw away, with every one-inch storm in Los Angeles, we throw away 10 billion gallons of water that we, we could be capturing and putting to use. So there's a water supply benefit, there's an energy benefit. And that's the beautiful thing about green infrastructure is these, these practices really started because, well, we have to stop pollution from stormwater runoff. And everybody realized, oh, wait, we have to stop flooding from stormwater runoff. This is a great way to do it. Hey, there's an energy benefit. Hey, there's a water supply benefit. There's open space benefits. There are habitat benefits. There are clean air benefits. And the list goes on from being using these projects. So I want to first start with the, the notion that Louisiana or, or New Orleans doesn't have all these other problems. It absolutely does. I'm going to start with this uh, drought map from 2011. And if you look, the eastern, or excuse me, western portion of uh, Louisiana is in severe drought. And even in New Orleans, we're in moderate drought in 2011. Now, a large portion of the city's water supply comes from the Mississippi River, and so that's probably not gonna dry up anytime soon. But it does significantly decrease its flow volume during times of drought. And one of the things that happens with that, when that happens is, noticing how close to the, the coast you are, is that salt water actually starts migrating up the river. And as that salt water migrates further and further north, there is the chance that it could actually reach the pumps at the base of the Mississippi River that New Orleans uses for its water supply. So all of a sudden, instead of pumping fresh water from the Mississippi, which still requires huge amounts of treatments, I, I certainly wanna, wouldn't wanna drink it straight, but you're now pumping salt water. 
And that creates a huge issue for the city's water supply. So there are reasons to maybe think about having you know, backup water supplies available or other, other resources available. And stormwater is absolutely one of those resources. I also want to go to the, the standpoint that these practices are actually feasible here. This actually can be done. This is a, a, from a study that we did with Dr. Richard Horner, who uh, was on the National Academy of Sciences expert panel on stormwater pollution um, that was done back in uh, the mid-2000s. And we asked Dr. Horner to look at different climatic regions in the United States and, and see really, you know, from different types of development, can you actually retain runoff on site? The five bars on the left uh, are from five different types of development. We looked at single family housing, multi-family uh, housing, commercial developments, uh, 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 redevelopment projects where there's really limited space on site. And we asked him using either just infiltration, which is sort of the dark blue color, or using infiltration and, and sort of a, a, a smattering of roof uh, management practices that really don't even consider uh, evaporation, which is something that absolutely would, would increase this. Could you retain, say, the 85th percentile storm on site, which is the orange bar, or the 95th percentile storm on site, which is the red bar? And what he found was that for most development types, you could actually retain all of the runoff that falls each year on site. You can manage the rooftop runoff. You can direct runoff to lawn space or, or drainage swells or other practices that are going to keep this runoff on site and prevent it from ever uh, uh, getting out into the surrounding watershed. The five bars on the right-hand side uh, looked at a scenario where clay soils were involved. And this is sort of analogous to uh, New Orleans' problem that you have shallow groundwater. And, and in those circumstances, he looked at, OK, infiltration isn't possible at all. I'm only going to look at sort of dispersing rooftop runoff or capturing rooftop runoff for, for reuse, assuming that there's enough demand for it. But I'm not going to consider evaporation. I'm not going to consider things like rain gardens or other practices that, that really could get rid of this, this runoff in other fashions. And even there, without considering a huge number of other practices that are available, we found you could probably contain anywhere between or retain 40 to 60% of the runoff that occurs on any given development site each year. Um, and to give you an example, this is from Atlanta, Georgia. They, they get 40 to 50 inches of rain a year, so not quite as high as here, but they still get a tremendous amount of rainfall. And these are practices that absolutely are workable in that part. And we found that this is replicated all across the country. It's feasible, it's beneficial, it's a no-brainer. This is what New Orleans should be looking at. So one of the practices I'm going to talk about that, that Dr. Horner actually didn't look at and, and that uh, I think Jeff alluded to are green roofs and why these are a, sort of a, a great first step for New Orleans and why they're, they're particularly useful. And we started looking at this for Southern California. People told us we were absolutely crazy to look at green roofs in the desert because, you know, why would you put a bunch of plants that are going to die off in the summer up on your roof? But it turns out that much like the other green infrastructure practices, green roofs work everywhere. They work in wet climates. They work in dry climates. They work in cold climates, warm climates. Doesn't matter, they work. They work in Germany, uh, they work in the US, all over the place. And there are huge benefits that green roofs provide. Chief among them, and, and for New Orleans concerns, is that just a three to four inch layer of soil, so a really thin green roof with uh, native plantings, not even looking at like large shrubs or anything that's gonna take up a lot of water, um, can usually retain a half inch to a one inch storm with absolutely no runoff. They're just gonna soak that water up, the plants will eventually evapotranspirate it, that runoff will never hit the ground. It'll never become a flooding issue or a pollution issue. And across the United States, the, the runoff retention rates are between 40 and 80% of annual runoff. This is a tremendous opportunity. So in terms of flooding, they also significantly de delay runoff when they do become saturated and, and uh, uh, eventually begin to, to have water percolate through. They delay runoff, so you get a lower peak flood, a lower flood volume. So even if, if uh, their capacity for retention is overwhelmed, they still prevent flooding from occurring. Um, one of the other benefits that go with green roofs is that they have a huge energy impact on the building below. And this does a couple things. First, green roofs actually prolong the lifespan of roofs. Typical roof on a house or a commercial building has to be replaced every 15, 20 years. They're finding from studies that green roofs, because they shade the rooftop, they protect it from uh, uh, the environment or, or weather or other effects, green roofs can last 50, 60 years before they need to re be replaced. So that's a, a huge lifespan benefit. But also, they have a, an incredible impact on the building below. Um, uh, the, the roof surface, or the air temperature above a, a typical tar roof surface on a sunny day can be 90 degrees above ambient air temperature. And a lot of that heat gets transmitted into the building below, particularly on the first two floors below. So you have increased need for building cooling, you have increased need for uh, uh, energy costs for 
uh, monetary cost to, to cool the interior of a building. But with a green roof, it reduces that need by 10 to 25% on the upper two floors and, and it is high as 75% in some case studies. So not only is the green roof soaking up water and preventing flooding, not only is it protecting your roof surface, but it's reducing the cooling cost, the energy that's needed and also the, the money that's needed to cool buildings. So for a place like New Orleans, that's, there's a potential huge benefit here. Um, I, I was discussing with a couple of people before I came in that there's sort of an inverse relationship between how hot a city is and the Arctic blast of air you get when you walk inside a building. Um, I, I walked into my hotel yesterday and was immediately frigid and wishing I had brought a, a winter coat with me. Um, for cities that like to stay cool indoors, these are a huge opportunity. So I, it's something that I, I really can't stress enough what, what an opportunity is. But I want to leave you with this. Um, across the spectrum of practices that, that Jeff have alluded to that I think will come up in, in future workshops here, this is a cost-effective practice. Um, traditional gray infrastructure, as it's called, or pipe systems, culverts, drainage systems, pumps that are required to get rid of stormwater runoff cost a lot of money. There's a lot of concrete. There's a lot of metal. There's a lot of piping. You have energy costs, as were explained, for, for pumping that water. Green infrastructure tries to make use of natural features on a property. You have a lawn, great, infiltrate the water through it. Put a green roof up and watch your, your roof lifespan increase and watch your, your energy costs go down. Put a drainage swell in a parking lot, green your streets. When you're, when you're ripping up the street and resurfacing it, put in a green street, make it a nicer looking street, but also manage all that runoff without the need for pipes. So this is a huge opportunity. The, the quote I'll leave you with is that this is from the National Association of Home Builders who have not exactly been friendly to us when we try to require these practices, but their, their publication stated, if you ever wished you could simultaneously lower your site infrastructure costs, protect the environment, and increase your project's marketability, using low impact development techniques you can. This is the way we need to be going, and we need to be doing it on a site scale, on a street scale, and on a regional scale, and I really hope New Orleans will embrace these practices. Thanks. So we started late and have run a little bit over, but that's all right, because it seems that we've captured your attention, and I think the, the three um, presentations have been absolutely excellent, and have, and have provided much, much fodder for further thought and discussion. So. As we start passing the microphone around, I'm just going to ask an initial question, just as the initial provocateur, and, and ask, I think all of you, each of you, and, and you know, feel free to respond or not as you see fit, but uh, based on what Mark had initially said about you know, becoming more purpose-driven and less compliance-driven, um, I was wondering about the implications that that has for governmental entities. I mean, what what... Doesn't this imply necessarily that there has to be much more cohesion among various governmental entities, both locally and, and regionally, and, and then even beyond that, nationally? Uh, we see a lot of this going on in in, um, in cooperative efforts between HUD and the EPA and other groups at the, at the federal level. Um, what are the implications for local and regional entities around this? And um, and, and, th and there's another sort of secondary part of this question as well, which is, what is the role of the private sector? As you all know, in Louisiana, the most important constituency in many cases is the business constituency. How do we get the business community to embrace these ideas and to become really a, a, a proactive advocate for a lot of the things that you all are talking about, that we collectively are talking about? Um, and finally, thank you very much, by the way, for putting up with what is the closest thing to Doctor Who's TARDIS in all of New Orleans. This building is, is progressive, but it is also so quite bizarre in many ways. So thank you for that. So I, I, I'll let each of you, any one of you or, or all of you respond to that and then we'll pass the microphone around. Thank you. Well, it, it's an interesting problem that's raised and I'm sure that, that Jeff and Mark have a, a lot to add to what I'll say, but um, we recently looked at, at some of the regulatory and statutory and legal barriers that you run into in trying to implement these types of projects. And, and a perfect example is that in in uh, the city of Los Angeles, I think there are something on the order of seven agencies that all have their hands in uh, uh, the requirements for constructing or redeveloping a street. It is incredible. And I would argue that all seven of them, or, or certainly the majority of them, really don't care about the stormwater runoff aspect. It's fire departments who are concerned about access for their vehicles. It is uh, uh, engineering departments that need uh, right-of-ways for uh, transmission lines. It's, uh, uh, you know, curb cuts and other issues that, that really have nothing to do with the stormwater. And so coordinating between those can be an, an absolute maze. And 
there have been any number of solutions that have been proposed, including having effectively green czars um, in municipal agencies that are there to try and coordinate this type of action. I, I think that's a terrific solution. It's one that comes with cost and, and isn't necessarily the best way to go about it, but it is absolutely clear um, that we need more coordination from agencies. We need more coordination from the agencies that are gonna benefit from this. The, the parks agencies, uh, school, uh, uh, school agencies, others that have the space need to be working with the agencies that deal with stormwater and flooding and, and, and it's something that uh, absolutely will be critical. This is, this is only when I'm speaking, this is incredible. Uh, um, uh, something that will be critical going on. One thing I will say is that there is going to be, a, to a degree, a, a, some help coming from the federal government on this in terms of a mandate. The EPA is currently considering a national stormwater rule that's going to be implementing things like we've seen in, in California and Philadelphia. It's going to probably require something on the order of an 85th or 90th percentile storm retention standard for all new development and redevelopment countrywide uh, over a certain size. And so that's going to provide cover for agencies that really want to do this but, but have trouble pushing the ball forward. But um, we definitely need to see more coordination from agencies and, and for them to recognize that there's benefit for all of them to, to try and use these practices. So there are, as Noah alluded to, there, there are some mandates out there from the federal level on, that come down that more or less dictate how a local government should do things. Th those are rare. It's usually a lot of local choice to uh, act in furtherance of some broad policy aim, or even more opaque is you know, some policy goal we really hope we wish you could do. But you know, if you don't, we understand. That, you know, a lot of the federal mandate is just that. Uh, there is stormwater rules that, as we speak, the, the state, the city, are going to have to what they call MS4 permits, this uh, uh, municipal multiple source system uh, permitting. Your cities are going to have to be more accountable for non-point source, the stuff that runoff that comes off of a street, off of a parking lot, and, and account for uh, how much of that is getting into our drinking water or, or, or bodies of water like the lake. Uh, that, I think, is, could be a game changer at some level in terms of ma regulations and mandates and, and building practices at the local level. But you know, I worked in city government here, and you, know, you get a lot of uh, I ideals when you're handed HUD dollars and FEMA dollars, after, particularly after a disaster. It's you know, kind of overwhelming. you got all this money to try to... Uh, you got great urban plans that come your way, but the playbooks that you ultimately either you've created you, the bureaucracy, or the ones that ultimately are handed to you to use the money, are typically old and outdated and built, you know, to make, as I always say, the city safe from the 70s. You know, it's not, it's not a very progressive, innovative view. Uh, and and, and th as, a bureau as bureaucracies go, that's, that's a hard thing to, to get, get past. You know, the, the playbook becomes sacrosanct. A, 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 an engineering spec for how to do a road is passed down from one employee to another over time, it becomes gospel. And so trying to change that, you're awash with ideas for how to do more pervious surfaces. And you, if you talk to FEMA at the highest level, they're like, hey, we want you to use our money more sustainably. But it's up to you to do it. There's no mandate. There's no requirement. And so the locals look at their playbook. Well, we don't do it that way. And, and onward we go. You know? And so I think you know, that, that's a challenge. But you know, to, to the point I was making earlier, I think we have that money in hand. And we're, we don't want for good ideas. And, intelligent council that is surrounding local government at this point to say, look, let's, let's press pause here and before we just go with the same old playbook, let's, let's try to do things differently. And I think the feds will bless that and help us along the way if, if we, if we uh, engage them. I think you know, Noah and Jeff have answered most of the questions you know, and, you know, as well as I would, if not much, much better. But the one I will address is the one about the private sector. Um, one of the issues with water, water is, when it flows, is normally a public thing. And it, you, know, you may have private rights to use it, but you don't own it. And we manage it normally these days in, in developed areas you know, through a regional or municipal system, which tends to mean that if the business community wants to interact, it has a very small customer base, very important customers. but. If, this, if the Department of Streets and Sanitation, Public Works, you know, the Surgeon Water Board, in this town or any others, you know, don't have the interest, the trust, the ability, whatever, to do things differently, um, it tends not to happen. And even ideas which are used elsewhere 
don't make it into the local codes, they don't make it into the buying specs, and quite frankly, no one develops the expertise. So you essentially are in a you know, self-contained, self-defined market. It's one of the reasons I think you know, things like zoning codes are hugely important. I mean, when I say that you know, compliance-driven, that can be, I mean, there are good parts to that. You know, I think when you're asking a, when, when a local government says, I will do something when EPA forces me, because then I can tell my taxpayers that they're making me do it. You know, I'm not asking them to be smart, I'm just asking them to be compliant. Um, that's one kind of issue. But when you actually do have things like zoning codes, land use uh, planning, uh, and, and the like, and you can make an incentive based as well, you can then begin to create you know, room for the entrepreneurs and the businesses, and you actually grow an economy at the same time you're bettering the community. Thank you. So I think we can open it up for questions from the audience. You've been very patient, and we, we're very grateful for that. Any questions? Please. Waste management, thank you. The, the water management at the local and state levels, is anyone using any kind of tax credits? And would they, how would that work on a, on a you know, more localized versus a national level? Uh, absolutely. A number of cities have stormwater fees, um, which are assessed in any number of... I, <laughs> On cue, I, I, it's all hydraulics. I, I, like to I have a poltergeist, apparently. So, uh, there there are a number of ways they're assessed, uh, but increasingly it's based on the the area of impervious surface um, that your particular building or development has, um, and and there are stormwater fees based on that that are then used to manage the stormwater system. Um, Philadelphia has some some fairly ambitious ones they're looking at. Uh, Los Angeles County just attempted to have one adopted, but it fell into a political sort of limbo at the moment, so we're waiting to see what will happen. But there are a number of these across the country where um, cities basically uh, uh, create a fee system based on the amount of paved surface and, and the amount of runoff that will be generated from any development. And, and they really do seem like a, a good way to fund these things so that cities aren't dipping into their own general funds in, in trying to uh, address stormwater runoff. And, and then this one's for Jeff. Are neutral grounds with the, the palm trees that I see are some of the trees that are being planted right now. Do you have any idea? It's kind of a uh, low-level question, but are, I think of them as trees that die. Are they also trees that aren't going to be helpful in terms of water management? It's a slow-hanging curve. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am not a tree expert, but I hang out with them. I. Uh, and I've been told that palm trees, and I believe this, have negligible value. They're very aesthetically pleasing. They, they give that air of, a, you know, the tropical environment that we almost live in. But they are doing nothing to absorb water. Now, the, the cypress is the king, and then there's a lot of other things in between that and palm trees and crepe myrtle that we could be investing in to line our boulevards. No, crepe, no, I know, in between crepe myrtles and, and, uh, and cypress. See, she's one of my tree people. <laughs> Other questions, yes. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is for Noah um, about regarding your presentation uh, with the green roofs. You had mentioned that they've proven quite effective in a number of different environments. I was wondering if there had been any uh, research on how they work in um, a high wind environment, 100 plus mile per hour winds, and then also if there's um, any um, any evidence on how they may work in historic structures with, say, you know, not a flat roof, but a gabled or, or, or a hip roof or, or um, something along those lines? Is, is it possible in that kind of capacity? More of a residential as well. Certainly. Um, I, I'm not entirely aware of, of research specifically on the, the high wind aspect. I, I imagine there may be some out there, and I know that several of the, um, uh, the locations that I've seen studies from, they have their own problem with, with tropical storms, probably not as intense as, as what's in New Orleans, but um, certainly with, with uh, you know, storms making their way up the East Coast generally. Um, as for residential, yeah, uh, green roofs will fit. I, I forget the exact angle, and so I don't want to you know, misquote any studies here, but I believe up to about 25 or 30 degrees on a pitched roof, green roofs will work. There is a load-bearing issue that goes with historical structures, so um, not every 
building already in existence necessarily maybe the, the best site without some serious retrofitting. Um, but certainly for new development with pitched roofs, um, uh, new development with f flat roofs, absolutely. And, and uh, the, the one I'll give is uh, the California Science Center has a wavy roof um, that has a, a green roof on it. And uh, there's been, you know, up to a, a fairly steep angle, there have been studies showing that they're just as effective. Thank you. Um, so one little bit of good news, uh, being an optimist anyway, that I am. Uh, EPA is, uh, is uh, promoting uh, holding low impact development design competitions with various cities around the country. And so tomorrow they invited me to go to DC to meet with the other cities to try to organize one for New Orleans. And then hopefully they'll fund it. And what's great about that is they did this in Houston, and I participated as a juror a few years ago, and it really got a lot of press, and a lot of things changed in Harris County and Houston just because of that low-impact development design competition. And they did it with both private development projects as, as some that people could compete against in design, and, and pu public projects. So they saw a range of ideas and got people excited. And so hopefully we'll get to do something like this maybe next year. So I'll, I'll uh, let you know. But that, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. So anyway, and, and no crepe myrtles, uh, Jeff. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. <laughs> Any other? Hey, I have sort of a technical question. Um, so, you know, after Katrina, one of the issues in, um, with, for the Sewage and Water Board were the number of leaks in the system, right? And even just quantifying how much FEMA should pay to repair and to bring it back to the status it was pre-Katrina and it wasn't really in great shape. And, um, and, uh, and then now, you know, the way I understand the science, which is not too well, is um, that, you know, what we're trying to do is retain more of the water without just pumping it all out, right? and um, uh, underground in the sponge, as you've said, Jeff. And uh, so, wouldn't the leaks be good? <laughs> there are people in the audience that are demonstrably reacting to that, but I, I, I would say, I, I, I had this conversation the other day, I, I think, you know, we, those leaks are uh, in, the in the worst possible place. They're underneath our streets, you know, so the idea is, no, uh, you know, you purposely retain water in a place where it's further up the field, so it's you know, higher ground, it's, and it's, you know, it's slowing the course of water through the pump system, through the bowl, into the pump station. And it's in areas, frankly, where you have soil that has a high degree of what we call shrink-swell capacity. Like the, the sponge gets dry and then, and then wet again, dry and wet again, and those droughts and rain, drought and rain, and that's what causes those... The, the, the cracks in the, in the pipes in, in, in our building. So, uh, no, uh, counterintuitively, holes in, in pipes are not good. <laughs> One. The issue is that the pipes are then going to drain the groundwater out because holes work in both directions. So the water is usually not coming out of the pipe, it's going in. And, and, then, and then you might have a sewer pipe nearby that's also broken, so you get water going. So it's, no. <laughs> Other questions? Hi guys. Um, with the surrounding region and the parishes, we're all facing terrible TMDL limits, which really stand for too many darn limits sometimes. But uh, is the federal transportation, I mean the highway department and the state highway departments in various states addressing their runoff issues that are impacting the local areas? They absolutely should be. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. We, uh, they are sometimes slow to adopt uh, the needed practices. And uh, I have found, at least in state transportation department permits under the Clean Water Act I've reviewed in many states, they are behind the times on the practices. It's still very much a treat it, get it in a pipe, and get it out of here uh, uh, approach, which ultimately really doesn't solve a lot of the problems. Um, you know, road surfaces contribute a, a large amount of pollution, uh, copper from brake pads, uh, metals, oils, um, any number of other wastes, and they, they do make up a large amount of surface area, so they provide a lot of stormwater runoff. So to the extent that um, 
you know, I can't say for, for, New, for New Orleans or for Louisiana what exactly the departments are doing, but, but certainly to the extent that these, you know, road building projects or road resurfacing projects are able to direct runoff from the roads to biofiltration, to infiltration, to uh, rain garden or other uh, vegetated areas where the water is just going to sort of pool and be taken up by plants, absolutely needs to be done because the, it, a highway and, and, and road runoff contributes to a large uh, degree of problems. On a practical matter, uh, what would it take to have now the CELA projects that they're ongoing, that they're not completed, but is there a way of adjusting or modifying those projects to make them now at this hour serve us better, as Jeff had pointed out, with these concave things rather than leaving them uh, in the other way directions? What would it take? Well, what kind of, a, uh, of the intervention will have to be made? Uh, it, it varies with where those CELA projects are. I mean, some of them that are being constructed right now, you know, you know, your ability to do, like, you know, pervious pavements on the, you know, on the parking areas are more limited. But, you know, Jeff and I actually met you know, at the Corps of Engineers with the CELA team about a week ago. And the basic answer is, if our local partner wants it, we'll try to do it. So what it's going to take is actually the city to ask. It's a pretty simple ask, but I was actually quite delighted because I went there waiting, looking for a number of, oh, we can't do it because of this, that, or the other. For the most part, they had a fair amount of flexibility, and they will build and they'll you know, do the green spaces and all those other things largely to the standard that the local partners want. Is that about right, Jeff? Yeah. I, I just, I mean, I, I, you know, it's a call to action, right? I mean, just get out there and demand it. And uh, fortunately, it's going to take some time. I mean, those, those corridors on Napoleon and Claiborne, Louisiana, we're talking about a year from now is when they're going to be putting dirt back on there. This is an opportunity to really kind of shape something that fits and is feasible. So it is a great uh, leadership opportunity for the city and certainly guys for us as citizens to ask for that. That is an option that should be employed. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it was great. Uh, the, the, in the core, they in the business of doing this stuff, but they have a client and it's local government and they'll do what they're told. It's kind of the point we were talking earlier about, you know, what the feds can or can't do at the local level. Yes. A follow-up on that question. I've heard Mark before discuss the CELA projects that are underway, whether they were well designed according to what you've just been presenting. And I think if he were in charge, they would be designed differently, but that's... Not necessarily better, but differently. It's, it's, a little, it's a little late, but now, now what you just said really struck the chord because in the area of finance, um, what I always want, worry about is any incremental cost. Uh, if you look at a, a, at a problem of sewage that the EPA had to force us to fix, and after forcing us to fix, the fix was put off for a long time because of the political will was not there to allow for the amount of cash flow to pay for the fix. So that requires some kind of political will. In the case of the CELA programs, are you suggesting that if we say, let's redesign the, in the following ways and they will do it, there wouldn't be a modification to the budgeted price already set, of which we are sharing a, you know, a substantial portion of? There may be. I and mean, it's one of the things I think this, you know, the city or any local partner has to think about. But the issue also is not you know, how much will it cost me to bring this phase of a project to conclusion. If you're essentially, you know, building tomorrow's problems today, and that when when you're when you are inducing, you know, the subsidence problems that we know we have, we know we will have the problems maintaining the infrastructure. We know that the streets are still going to be a problem. We know that we're going to have you know subsidence around the edges of those culverts. And anybody who drives down any number of our streets that have you know culverts, it's you know it's like driving off a cliff to get to the curb that those are problems that you know, we're, we can manage for. So you can actually extend the life of your investment, uh, or you can just make a smaller investment. And that's one of our choices. And I think that's, we have to decide, again, whether we're trying to you know, limit our expenditures or maximize our value. And again, there's no one answer. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I think the local partner has to know what it's prepared to ask 
Uh, but you're getting, I would hope, extended value. And that's the key thing, because if you're not getting value, I'm not sure why you'd be asking. Well, I could just, in a follow-up on that, may I just suggest that the projected way to pay for all of this new drainage expenditure, those that are underway and not completed yet, so the bill hadn't been sent in, and those that you propose is some form of a drainage fee, which no one has experienced yet. I would tell you that there is no political possibility that you can tell people to pay for something that we're going to add tax you for and no one knows what that task is going to be on them. And in a follow-up, how will it be enforceable? Those that I've looked at in other parts of the country are backed out by a property tax or the right to take over the property and put a lien on it. That's not what's being suggested here. And I wonder with our, drain with our garbage tax, in which we probably have 35% delinquency, how are you going to enforce the collection of a drainage fee? Um, I'll answer and then I'll let, let the other guys. Um, first of all, again, if you don't have the will to you know, follow through on the things you say you're going to do, such as a, a garbage tax, you can expect cynicism and, and, and lack of success. I think the issue of whether we're going to have a drainage you know, fee is not whether people here want it today. The real question is what are their choices going to be in the future? Repetitive losses are going to limit insurability in this city. That's a fact. If we find ourselves with vast areas that go out of commerce, I think the notion of what is politically saleable will change. I think it's up to us as you know, citizens to prepare ourselves not for a tax because we want a tax. We have to find a way to finance what must be financed. And we need to remind ourselves and our neighbors that the city that we inherited was not built by the federal government. It was built by people who were essentially willing to, to pay the freight to get the goods. Any other questions? Sorry. Yes. You had one. I'm sorry. I work for the local seal of sponsor, the Surgeon Water Board, and we have asked, and the Corps has said yes. So I think you will see along Cleveland Avenue, uh, Dwyer is going to be the first project we have asked, and I think people will be pleased with the yes. Thank you. One more? Well, let's have a couple more. Two more? Two more. We started late. It's about a community conversation, so let's just go to midnight until, we're, <laughs> until we pass out. Let's go. Please, sir. <laughs> Don't say that to a lawyer. They talk too much. Uh, I, I want to take off on something that Jeff had said about the, the old 1970s playbook, and this can be addressed to any of y'all. A, a lot of the ordinances that are already in place, whether it's zoning, land use, subdivision, flood hazard ordinance, are sort of the enemies of good water management and probably the enemies of the infrastructure they're trying to do. Hey, do you know of any cities that have done what I call uh, maybe an ordinance audit? where you go through and, and sort of at least fine-tune what you have before you do anything new? This is sort of where uh, some cities have done it voluntarily, but this is where those Clean Water Act permits come in. Um, the, under the Clean Water Act, uh, cities are required to have permits for the discharge of their stormwater runoff to any water of the United States, and they, they typically do these on regional-wide or, or statewide basis. Um, and a lot of those permits, as they increasingly start putting in place low impact development and green infrastructure requirements, you know, retention of the 85th percentile storm, retention of an inch of stormwater runoff, have clauses in them that say that you have to come up with an ordinance to implement this. And as a result, you have to go through your own existing ordinances and find terms that might be in conflict with this requirement uh, and reconcile the, the, the requirements. So they, they do actually, um, as these permits come along, they, they sort of integrate with local requirements and, and try to force them to update um, and there are cities that are doing that on their own, and, and we would certainly encourage that. That's something that needs to happen. So. We have a question back here. Um, if all of the suggestions presented today and everything that we talked about was implemented in a perfect world, would you foresee a substantial amount of job creation for these new strategies? Un unquestionably. Um, these are construction jobs, they're technology development jobs, they are maintenance jobs, uh, they are, you know, uh, uh, any kind of job you can think of in sort of a green technology sector from the, the scientific research and development uh, all the way down to 
construction, um, uh, uh, maintenance, and, and, and sort of the, the lowest possible uh, and thought process involved um, spur jobs. And it's, uh, you know, th there's a green jobs economy that is rapidly growing. Uh, Portland is a perfect example of this. They've, they've had tremendous success with this kind of project and it really needs to spread across the country. Okay, other questions? Okay, I'm, I just can't help it. I'm gonna ask one more and then we'll finish and then we'll have some wine and refreshments outside. Please, yes. <laughs> that was Ellen's question. Who owns the property? Uh, it, it really depends. And it, 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 all green roofs are different. They're, they're not created equal. There are green roofs where, uh, you know, particularly in, in sort of more arid climates, people use native plantings that pretty much after they're, they're sort of established for the first year or so, they kind of take care of themselves. Um, not not going to happen here, absolutely. Um, it, it really depends. Um, there are any number of ways that it, can be, that it can be sort of taken care of. Usually it falls to the individual sort of property owner or commercial development owner um, to take care of it. And that can be done through, you know, uh, uh, contracts with the city that come out when, they're, when they're, the property is built, a whole host of mechanisms. There may be, you know, depending on how fees are set up, um, as these kind of practices are used, that one of the incentives can be that the city will take care of this if there's enough of a fee mechanism for it. Um, it really just depends. We so. have a lot of unemployed nutria. <laughs> so just one quick final question. And this comes from a slightly less sanguine place, so I hope we don't end on too much of a low. But um, uh, Mark had, had observed earlier on in the conversation that, that proximity to water resources will determine which communities prosper. But Mark, do you think that that's, that's a time-limited uh, statement, or at least the veracity of that is time-limited? Because isn't there a political calculus in all of this as well? I mean, Louisiana is not the most, does not have the most robust population, and even though recent data uh, has indicated that its, its population is starting to stabilize and even grow a little bit, there are huge communities with a lot of political clout, like Las Vegas, and there are people like Robert Glennon, whose book you've <coughs> told me about and, and that I read. He's uh, an Arizona-based attorney who deals with water matters, who was saying that the, the Las Vegas Water Authority has designs, as, he, as you intimated, in, in, in this very day on, on some of our water. So what about the political calculus in all of this? Well, I, as I say, I think proximity to water provides preference, but preference is not destiny. You know, it's been observed that water you know, both flows downhill and to power. And I think that that is what we would expect. But I also think that anybody who thinks that the, you know, the cities that have been growing over the last 25 years are destined to be the cities that grow in the next 50 years just because that's the way it's been hasn't looked at, at Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Columbus, Louisville, any number of other cities and, and New Orleans that used to be the go-to cities, used to be the growth centers. Nobody has a birthright on prosperity. You have to decide how badly you want it. And again, if you have a natural advantage and you aren't prepared to make, you know, take advantage of it, I can promise you someone else will. Um, I'll, I'll point to, uh, it's interesting that Las Vegas was raised. I think they have their designs on a lot of people's water. Uh, we, we see proposals for pipelines from Canada, from the Columbia River in, in Oregon and Washington, from out east, from you name the source, they've thought of a, a pipe that they could sink into it. Um, and that goes for a lot of the, the western cities in particular, where water supply really is a, a concern. But, you know, at least for that part of the country, I'll end on sort of a more upbeat point, which is we, we have most of the water we need, or if not all of the water we need. And, and one of the things I talked about was you know, Los Angeles. There are 25 million people in that region. Gets about 10 inches of rain a year, and it doesn't have a ton of surface water supply sources. Got a lot of groundwater that's being put to use, but we really need to start looking for other sources. But when it rains, we generate a lot of water. And if we can put that water to use, we can supply our, our population needs. We also need to look at efficiency and other you know, means of, of sort of creating water supply. Um, the United States is a very, very water hungry country. We use more than most of the, the developed wor world on a per capita basis. And so we need to address that. We need to, you know, don't put a lawn in the desert. Don't take that 20 minute shower every day. Um, don't use appliances that, that are giant water hogs. Uh, 
there's any number of ways that we can create additional water supply for places that don't have it. Uh, for New Orleans, it seems the problem is more trying to deal with the water you do have, and, and there are any number of ways to do that. And in many cases, they're going to be the same solutions. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. Another round of applause for our guests. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. And please don't forget, the next installment of our series comes June 5th, same time, same place. So thank you again. <laughs>